Welcome back everyone to the final session of the first day of our 2021 Pride at Work conference. A uh, huge thank you to Jamie, who is your host for today. Um, like every Dublin Pride event, there's an army of people behind it, as well as Jamie here in Pride studio. We also have Chris working with us. Uh, we're missing Eddie today and we're all wishing him a speedy recovery. I'm sure he'll be back for our Pride events in June. Uh, did you all see our lovely backdrop behind us as well? Uh, that was a gift from our friends at Irish Life. Uh, if I'm honest, I'm not entirely sure if it was a gift. There is a chance that when we were packing everything up after last year's conference in the convention centre, we just took it and they were too polite to say anything. Um, but sure, look, we have it now. As well as us working here, we have our teams in Fuel and Lumio. Fuel's offices are just across the road from us and Lumio have their control centre and we've got Damo who has been our stage manager since 2015, uh, Shane, Pedro, Amy, Brian and Carl who are all working hard and of course our signers Vanessa, Leanne and Alison. So a huge thanks to everyone who's been working on this event today and again tomorrow. You might have spotted as well over the day we have a few of our former Dublin Pride Grand Marshals have been popping up uh, right next to me on the screen. Uh, this way, you can see this year's Grand Marshal uh, representing frontline workers in Ireland, the wonderful Vanessa. Uh, earlier today, we had our Grand Marshal from 2008, Tony Walsh. Back then, the theme of Pr Dublin Pride was always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And I promise that wasn't a dig at Tony. That was actually part of a campaign to highlight the fact that we didn't have marriage equality. Uh, and fittingly, the Grand Marshal from 2015, when we finally got marriage equality, uh, is here today. I'd also like to give a huge thanks to Bank of Ireland and Irish Life, who have been today's two session sponsors. And that leads us nicely into the subject of our final session of the day, which is the role of philanthropy in supporting LGBT communities. And Dublin Pride is delighted to have been able to partnership up with the Community Foundation of Ireland. To chair this session, uh, we have a woman with many, many different titles, but I'm going to use my favourite of all. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2015 Dublin Pride Grand Marshal, Dr. Gronya Healy. Thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful welcome and uh, I'm delighted uh, to be facilitating our conversation uh, this afternoon in the company of uh, so many thought leaders from the LGBTIQ uh, plus sector. So uh, I have some initial comments of my own on the matter and then I want to introduce our illustrious uh, panel and allow them to offer their reflections on the key achievements uh, of the past and the present, but also outline the challenges and why philanthropy is a mo most useful tool for advancing our rights. Firstly, I go back to my role as the chair of marriage equality in the early mid noughties. It was the Community Foundation for Ireland which gave marriage equality our very first grant to pay for a piece of research outlining why marriage equality mattered. It was a very small grant, and I mean a very small grant, but it helped us to leverage other funds by showing other funders that we were identified as change makers by Community Foundation and that therefore, uh, you know, we should be supported by others. This was perhaps the first and arguably the most significant grant that marriage equality ever got uh, in terms of being strategic. Secondly, uh, in terms of philanthropy and its wider role, it was through the grants of Atlantic Philanthropies that marriage equality began to build our organization and build and air our arguments, grow our base and convince the public and politicians and indeed our own sector that marriage equality was a significant rights issue worthy of philanthropic support. It is regretful that Atlantic Philanthropies funded us only until 2012 when civil partnership was introduced and we had to stretch that grant 
and seek other support from individuals and friends until we succeeded to get the Citizen Assembly to vote by 79% for a referendum and subsequently joined with Glenn and ICCL in 2014 to form Yes Equality to fight and win that referendum by 62%. The rest, as they say, is history. Thirdly, I was asked to join Community Foundation for Ireland as a board member a couple of years ago. The view from the board uh, of the work of Community Foundation is really illuminating and it has given me a great sense of the scope and breadth uh, of the work. With the appointment of Denise Charlton as the new CEO, there is no doubt that this is a hugely significant time for Community Foundation, but also for all of us in the wider community sector. There is a strategic planning process underway, and I think under Denise's leadership and with the board, there are major opportunities to continue the change-making work for the LGBTQI plus sector that we are all so committed to, both as grantees, but also growing the donor base, which is so important. Without donors, there are no grants. So today then is an opportunity to hear from uh, some of the LGBTIQ plus leadership, to hear their thoughts on emerging needs. And yes, Community Foundation for Ireland has funded almost a million euro to uh, groups, our groups, since 2000. So let's hear what the issues and the appetite for change is from our wonderful panel of thought leaders uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce the whole panel now to you and then I'll go to them one after the other uh, and they will have their spake and then hopefully we'll have some time to take questions. If you have questions, participants, please put them in the chat box and we'll we put them uh, to the speakers. If they're particular questions for particular speakers, say that in your question. Otherwise, I'll divvy them up uh, as I see uh, fit. So uh, each speaker then will have five minutes and as I say we'll then open to a wider panel discussion. Our panel this afternoon uh, include uh, Denise Charlton who is the CEO of Community Foundation for Ireland um, and there she is leading the response to COVID-19. A human rights, equality and social justice champion, a campaigner, a former CEO of the Immigrant Council and Women's Aid, Denise has huge experience of working with donors, including philanthropists, and I had the pleasure uh, of working with her on many initiatives of change, including uh, as co-founder uh, of Marriage Equality all those years ago, uh, and also in our Social Intelligence Associates uh, initiative, where Denise and I delivered leadership training for NGO leaders for the past four years. Denise will speak about how philanthropy and community foundation contributed to advancing LGBTI plus issues and talk about what is the future of CFI LGBT fund uh, uh, to all of us and really kick off the conversation. I'll then go to Lisa. Where is Lisa? Uh, Lisa Connell, she, her, is managing editor of GCN and has been part of that superb media organ for over a decade. She is a tireless LGBT plus activist. She's a core member of Mother and is also a voluntary director of the company Dublin Pride. Lisa is a thinker, a challenger, and it was my great pleasure to have Lisa as a hugely significant contributor on the most recent Social Intelligence Associate Leadership Programme. Lisa will speak about how philanthropy has made a difference to GCN and the wider community, and I think will identify some of the issues where philanthropy could continue to really make a difference. Our third speaker is Paula Fagan, and Paula is the CEO of LGBT Ireland. A veteran of LGBTIQ plus rights, Paula has led LGBT Ireland to grow and expand its services and reach. A founding member, a board member of Marriage Equality, Paula researched and was author of some of Marriage Equality's most significant research, laying out the need for marriage equality, in particular the need for equality for LGBTIQ plus headed families. Paula will speak about the emerging needs in the COVID-19 context requiring philanthropic support. 
And we'll speak about how philanthropy has made a difference to LGBT Ireland and then I think looking to the future. Our fourth speaker I'm delighted to welcome is Oshin O'Reilly and Oshin is the head of fundraising and operations with Belong To where he has been involved for over 10 years. Oshin served on the board of Belong To and then joined the team as a manager and he's been leading fundraising activities since 2013. He's a former member of IGLIO, the youth uh, European uh, uh, LGBT organization, where he worked across the wider pan-European region on LGBT young people. Oshin will tell us about how philanthropy has made a difference to belong to and also will identify what the issues for young LGBT plus people are. Finally, last but not least, we're very happy to welcome one of our sponsors, Irish Life Canada Life, Gavin Hennessy. Gavin is Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Irish Life and Canada Life and is a UCC and a Smurfit School alumni. He's worked across the globe in Africa, India and Eastern Europe and he previously worked in diversity and inclusion roles in LinkedIn and Business in the Community Ireland where he has helped to develop many groundbreaking uh, programmes. Gavin will tell us how he thinks corporates make a difference to LGBT issues and what we can learn from the international uh, experience. So that's my introduction and my introductory com comments. Can I go straight to Denise Charlton and invite her to address the audience? Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Gronia. And look, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today and to be on such a, a panel with such change makers. Um, so and to help us at Community Foundation inform our thinking. A big, huge shout out and a thank you uh, Winter Pride and Pride at Work for facilitating the conversation. Um, I come to my remarks, um, uh, I suppose, twofold, as Gronje said, as somebody who's been involved and had the privilege of seeing some of the progressive change um, in relation to equality in Ireland, uh, but also very cognizant of the challenges that still remain. Um, I come to my remarks as somebody who has been a beneficiary, has worked in organisations that have been funded by philanthropy, and I've really seen the difference it can make and how it can make a difference and really highlighted some of those uh, key moments that philanthropy um, uh, supported and I come to it then in the the new role that I have the privilege uh, to having uh, which is the CEO of Community Foundation for Ireland and having watched the brilliant work it's done over the years uh, coming together with the fantastic staff and board to look at how we can reinvigorate our commitment to LGBTIQ+, uh, what we can do going forward, how we can encourage philanthropy to continue in the road to equality. Um, there are a couple of things, I suppose, to highlight. One is the, the global uh, context, which everybody's so aware of. And I suppose as we watch the hostility that some of our allies are experiencing um, across the globe, closer to home in Poland, the, the um, LGBTI plus Q free zones, uh, the difficulties uh, for those in Malaysia, the new policies that are so anti-LGBT. Um, when we look then to the those that are living in secrecy in Russia, in Iran, in Turkey, all because of serious fear of injury or death. And then we bring that back nationally and we see, I suppose, extreme far right across uh, Europe and beyond. And maybe we think to ourselves, well, look, we're not so bad here. But actually, you can see in recent events how those who are uh, in opposition to equality and to our community, how they're emboldened by wider international hostility and movement. And you can see some of that being amplified here and echoed here. We see, we've seen it on social media. We've seen it when some of our public figures have been targeted. And we see it in some of the, the recent um, on-street demonstrations. So we can't rest on our laurels. We also see it, and I'm sure we'll hear more from, from Ushing. We see it when Belong To say that six out of 10 young people, an issue for them is actually coming out. And, and obviously that's a stark reminder of the need for allies uh, for our younger population, our LGBT uh, plus Q um, populations. You know, six years after marriage equality, that wonderful moment in our history uh, of progress, we, we are aware um, of, of still what needs to be done. 
So uh, we're here to talk about philanthropy. And as I said, I've had the experience on both sides of the table, as I say. Um, and I, I've seen what Community Foundation has done, and Grania has alluded to some of those um, key moments in its history. Um, for me, Community Foundation has always been cutting edge. It's over. Maybe other people haven't gone yet, or it has supported uh, issues that are are unsupported, unprotected, the more vulnerable and um, the more invisible. And I've watched as the foundation over the last 21 years has really supported frontline organizations at both at a local and a national level. It supported advocates uh, to the front of the change agenda. Uh, Grania mentioned mar marriage equality, early grants going to the lesbian collective, uh, Money is going to GCN, to that wonderful voice in our community. And we're going to hear from Lisa and um, chronicling all our history in our country and continuing to be a shining light and, and the voice for, for many of us. Um, and so I, I've seen Community Foundation be there where change is needed, uh, where it needs to be tweaked um, and how it's been able to offer that support. I've seen it offer support to Tenny, the core counseling center, to fund information and support for counselors and psychotherapists uh, in relation to transgender, uh, working with our, our colleagues up in Drogheda, outsiders and uh, moving their support online uh, recently, in particular to mental health and wellbeing, which obviously is huge for our communities in a pandemic and really been amplified. And we've done that with other organization, organizations such as Shout Out. Um, We've also uh, looked to partners in terms of new communities, again, working with Belong To, so that they can, I suppose, increase their help and support to more diverse uh, service users and those who need it. So providing information languages, uh, uh, Polish, French and Lithuania. And over the years, I've watched the foundation give support to whether it's Sporting Pride, the arts or our festivals. So, so really, I suppose, observing how it's looked at uh, local partners for, for, uh, uh, for partnership and support and keeping people connected and informed, well, but then also partnering uh, bigger organizations um, and uh, more national organizations. So, so that's something that we have always done over the years. And now, as Gronia says, we're uh, in a new stage. We're going to be 21 this year. We're growing up um, and we want to reinvigorate that commitment. We want to restate that commitment. And today is the first part of the consultation with those who are our strategic partners, who are to the forefront and they who know what needs to be done, where philanthropy can help and where investment and strategic partner is needed. So what we want to do is to, to launch a fund. We want to invite our donors, existing donors and new donors um, to come with us on a journey that can provide support to the LGBT plus Q uh, community. Um, we've already had fantastic support from Dublin Pride uh, in this regard. And so what we want to do after consultation with our strategic partners is to launch a fund in Global Pride in June. So we'll be looking for donors from the get-go, and I hope that there are some uh, donors that are out there, some corporate organizations, including the sponsors of this event, that have been honest with us uh, in that journey um, to equality already, and that they might uh, work with us um, in, in the relationship with fund. Um, we'll need it post-COVID. Let's hope we are going to be post-COVID. Uh, the continuing role in lockdowns are taking the plan for sure. Sure, once we are post COVID, we know that the shadow of it will stay with us for a long time. We know that inequalities have been amplified, and we know that those challenges of mental health, isolation, well being are there for our communities. So we look forward and we invite uh, donors, uh, potential donors, to come with us, whether it's a legacy whether it's a philanthropic gift, uh, whether it's an ongoing strategic relationships, we really hope that you'll come with us. What we do know in Community Foundation, no matter where we can put resources, the demand way outstrips what we can provide. And the pandemic has really amplified that. So we will need um, considerable amount of resourcing to be able to continue on the road to equality. In conclusion, over the coming weeks, it's our hope, as well as the days getting longer, warmer, brighter, 
that the new fund will start forming, that you'll come with us. Anybody that's out there, please get in touch. And that come the days of summer, when the restrictions allow us to gather again, that we will have great news to share with our community. So on that upbeat note, let me wish everybody uh, a happy work pride. Thank you very much. That's super, Denise. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Good news on a day and in a week where there hasn't been much of it. Uh, so well done. And um, we look forward to June and to the developments. Um, I'm going to go straight away now to Lisa Connell. I've already introduced Lisa. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gráinne. Um, I just want to start by saying it's fantastic to be involved in this panel. Um, what a great bunch of folks to share this hour with. Um, and I guess I'll start by giving, hopefully everyone knows GCN, but just in case, um, GCN is Ireland's national LGBTQ plus press. Um, we actually are about to mark 33 years in publishing this year. And um, we have one of our more recent marketing campaigns is, uh, has the slogan reflecting queer life in Ireland and that's exactly as um, Denise mentioned that's exactly what we've been doing and what we uh, continue to be emboldened and encouraged to do even when things get really hairy and and difficult and stressful as they will in our sector um, and I suppose before I kind of go into the philanthropic piece and the importance and and the the kind of meditation around that I think that one of the things, and um, both Denise and Gronia have touched on, really two big elements are the story of LGBTQ plus rights in Ireland has been almost like an amazing epic um, and and we've seen such a, amazing progress and change in, in a short period of time. But the global context is still really challenging. And I'm so glad um, Denise used the road as an analogy because we're still very much on a journey and the support, philanthropic support is so key to that. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to share on this panel, two words kept really coming back uh, to the center of my thinking and that, those are sustainability and predictability. Um, our sector, uh, the LGBTQ plus sector, and then obviously the charitable sector tech sector in general, has always been challenged and kind of always will in that we are we're a gutsy lot and we make a little go a long way, um, but that comes at a very high cost. And you know what we know. Um, in terms of making change is that that really needs, uh, it needs buy-in to use a sort of a, a more commercial uh, expression. It needs that buy-in um, from lots of different stakeholders if you actually want to make change. And so to actually uh, share a little, um, my first uh, encounter with Community Foundation for Ireland was actually back in my LGBT noise days, which feels like 743 years ago. and. Community Foundation were in fact uh, one of the first organizations to give uh, LGBT noise any money, which just shows their uh, kind of uh, punk uh, sort of uh, uh, attitude. Um, but Community Foundation has been uh, very specifically as an organization has been incredibly supportive of our community um, in its 21 years, uh, particularly to GCN. And in fact, I just wanted to shout out um, Community Foundation enabled GCN to celebrate its 30th birthday in the at the level that we did, which was so, so fantastic. And it was such a, a validating um, process for us to, because obviously our job is to reflect queer life and to keep our, uh, we, our core kind of areas that we focus on our education, information and entertainment. And um, that can be challenging to keep delivering but what I am so kind of delighted to be able to share today is that we have such a vibrant sector that the work that LGBT Ireland does on day on the daily belong to all of the organizations out there doing their thing. We actually have the privilege of 
reporting on and amplifying the work that's already happening. So if we never did a, a kind of another campaign of our own again, we'd be busy even just amplifying the other parts of our community. And that's so important. But obviously, to, to bring it back to the organization, GCN has an interesting hybrid model in that it is a we are a media entity, but we are also a registered charity. And so like all of uh, the fellow panelists and, and indeed the wider community sector with COVID, there was a very immediate and, and, and significant impact. And for us, um, one of the big areas that, that uh, we suffered a, a losses in was our live events. Um, as Bronya mentioned in my, from my little bio, I'm one of the co-organizers of Mother Club, which is a nightclub. And we run pretty big pride parties and, and other parties through the year. So our ability, um, and Mother is a, uh, uh, mother contributes oh excuse me mother contributes directly back into gcn um at, as our as our lead kind of event so um that was uh that's that is very challenging to the idea of both predictability and sustainability so phil philanthropic support and the support of that structure and type is going to be in a post-COVID context is going to be really important to keep all of our organizations um, going and to allow us to continue doing the work and in my case allow me to continue amplifying the other work that's uh, done. So I will hand back to Gronia at this point. That's great, uh, Lisa. Thank you very much. And in fact, I remember that 30th birthday party and the wonderful exhibition um, in the photographic gallery of all of the covers over so many years. It was fantastic. Uh, so well done on that. So GCN is 33 and Community Foundation is only 21. So, um, you know, lots of celebration uh, to be done. I'm going to go next to Paula Fagan, whom I've already introduced. Paula, over to you. Thanks, Gronia. Thank you very much. And, and hello, everybody. Um, I've been asked to speak about, I suppose, the emerging needs in a COVID context. So I suppose the first thing I'd like to say really is that um, that a COVID com the COVID context has really amplified the challenges for certain populations within the LG LGBT community um, who experiences challenge experience challenges in ordinary times. So the people we're most concerned about in a COVID context are really the people that we're generally um, more concerned about in our services. So while things have greatly improved in Ireland, and I know a number of panelists have already spoken about that, and we can certainly see a positive trajectory in Ireland. And I think that's really important to say to people, you know, so that to acknowledge, I suppose, the the work that has been done and it is making a difference so i think everybody that's listening who's in their lgbti staff networks who's working in activism i think it is making a difference and you can certainly see that in the european context if you look at say the fundamental rights agency survey from last year and um, you could see how ireland how prejudice and discrimination uh, discriminatory attitudes towards lgbti people they are reducing and we're going in the right trajectory compared to other European countries. So that's really important. However, unfortunately, um, many people in Ireland still aren't safe. It's not safe for them to be out, to be who they are. And it's not safe for them, I suppose, in, in, in their home, in their accommodation, in, in, in certain care settings, and also in certain workplaces. So um, the people that we're, we see struggling mm -hmm. and we're most concerned about in our services would be LGBTI people who are living in direct provision. It, that is a very difficult environment um, for people who have an LGBTI identity. I think for also LGBTI members of the traveling and Roma communities, um, unfortunately, they are still a very, very invisible group and marginalised group within their own community and indeed within the LGBTI community. And unfortunately, we see very high rates of suicide um, among LGBTI uh, traveller and Roma. So that's a huge concern. And also a, a, a population that is very at risk is our older LGBTI population. And unfortunately, 
we can see through our own services and in research that that population is actually experiencing, they have diminished support networks compared to their um, heterosexual peers. And also, I suppose, older LGBTI people we can see have are at more risk of mental health, mental and physical health, um, health difficulties. So at the beginning of, of the last lockdown in October, which we had hoped was would be the end, but it wasn't, um, we undertook an online survey with the community in partnership with GCN and NXF, NXF to see, I suppose, what, what the impact of the restrictions were on our community. We'd over 2,000 responses. We actually had to close the survey because we we tipped over um, the, the figure we, we'd hoped to get. Um, and I suppose, un unfortunately, it, it confirmed our worst fears, and that was that um, LGBTI people in general are more affected by the restrictions, but in particular, um, people who are more marginalised. So LGBTI people living in direct provision, 90% of those who responded to the survey had a, a serious decline, had experienced a serious decline in their mental health. And that's compared to 51% of the general population in other COVID uh, context surveys. Followed in that is, is the very serious decline in mental health among LGBTI traveler and Roma, and also then um, a decline of supported in above general levels by older LGBTI people. And one third of the respondents to the survey said that they couldn't be out and they were uncomfortable in their home environment to be themselves. So that's a very serious concern and we can see that in our own helpline and uh, we saw unfortunately saw a threefold increase in the number of people contacting mm. us who were experiencing homophobia and transphobia in, in their own home as well as a, an increase in, in calls about domestic violence. We also saw a fourfold increase on, on the same period in the previous year for older people contacting our helpline who are um, experiencing severe isolation and loneliness and severe anxiety. So what we've done to respond, we've increased our online services. We've developed an older and bolder mm -hmm. online community group. We run health and wellbeing events um, during the week, every week. And we also have a facilitated coffee morning online. We have over 250 members of that group now. We also, in the very early stages of COVID, we had a small emergency fund, which we used to buy mobile phones or smartphones for people living in direct provision, so they could they had no other means to access our online support. Um, and also, we were about to uh, we're in planning stages now to launch a telefriending service for older LGBTI people, so they can get a weekly call from a dedicated volunteer to try and tackle the isolation and loneliness that people are experiencing. But in the longer term, um, the main way that we're going to improve, I suppose, the health and well-being outcomes, particularly for older LGBTI people, are is to train um, mainstream services. So that's a that's a big project for LGBT Ireland. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, older LGBTI people are reluctant; they they won't go and get healthcare when they really need it. Um, and unfortunately, that. What we see is that older LGBTI people are more likely to present in, a, in an acute care setting, which could have been prevented. So they're waiting far too long to access healthcare. And I'm going to show you a short video clip now in one moment um, of older people speaking about the reasons for that. So we've developed a specialist program mm -hmm. called the LGBT Champions Program. And we're, we're we've developed a specialist training for people working in older LGBTI health and social care services. And what we've done really is we've mapped out who are the main health care professionals, old, if you're older, that you're going to engage with. Of course, the top five are GPs, public health nurses, social, social workers in acute and primary care, and also nursing staff, if you're in a nursing home uh, setting. So believe it or not, when we mapped it all out, there's only 1,500 uh, professionals that we need to train to achieve uh, a champion in every older person service across the country. So that's our plan. We can roll that out over three years, but we do need uh, investment to really achieve a full rollout across Ireland and make every healthcare setting that an older LGBTI person is likely to walk into to make them inclusive. We've already had great success with the programme. 
um, for example, we've trained eight champions in St. James's Hospital and they've transformed LGBTI care to older LGBTI people in that setting and it's really wonderful to see. So finally, just to say, I suppose I also what phil philanthropy, the difference it has made to LGBT Ireland. So firstly, to say LGBT Ireland simply wouldn't exist if it wasn't for philanthropy. Uh, over a decade ago, uh, the Community Foundation for Ireland really wow. saw the vision and, and backed the vision of uh, volunteers who came together and saw the need for a national service. I think at Community Foundation in particular are very, really are very clear around the need to to back people, to invest in capacity building as well as infrastructure. And really that investment <coughs> has, has shown has shown to be worthwhile. Um, you can see that in we've a very skilled network of volunteers working around the country who not only deliver the helpline, but can respond really quickly to emerging needs like we've seen in the COVID context. I think the most important um, you know, the most important aspect of philanthropic funding is how flexible it can be, how responsive it can be. And we've seen that in the in the emergency funding, the millions of euros that, that philanthropic organisations have put into the social, uh, the social care sector, and that's been really important to respond to COVID. And lastly, I would say that uh, philanthropy have the unique opportunity to support issues and projects that are hard to get funding elsewhere. And Grony's already spoke about how they supported marriage equality long before it had uh, the popularity that it had towards the end of the campaign. And when you're working for very marginalised and invisible groups as we are, it is very hard to evidence the level of um, need you to, to, to secure core funding. So therefore philanthropic, philan philanthropy can play a very important role in backing in projects and initiatives in the early stages. Okay. So I would appeal to anyone listening um, who to invest in the LGBTI fund. So I'm going to say, roll it there, Shane. I want, we want to show a short video of the, for, about older people speaking about healthcare. Thank you. As I'm growing older now, my biggest fear, I suppose, as a trans person needing assistance or some type of care, would be that they don't respect who I am. That I'll be known as the trans person down in bed seven and not Patricia down in bed seven. You can't legislate for kindness, but you can create an atmosphere of that sort of caring, understanding, kindness. Uh, sexuality and orientation and everything else is totally central to, to a human being. It's the fear of judgment and the fear of rejection. So we're coming from a very, very vulnerable place. And that needs to be treated very tenderly and gentle and with a huge amount of compassion. Wow, <clears throat> what a really moving video. Uh, Paula, thank you so much for that. Um, stark facts that you presented uh, to us, but I think really laying out the needs that are there in our community and that many of us have, and I suppose that many of us as we get older would have huge concerns into the future about. So thank you for, for the work you're doing. I'm going to move on before we open up for, for conversation to Oshin, uh, who who's working with uh, younger people to hear what he has to say. Oshin, you're very welcome. Um, thank you so much, Grania, and to everyone else. It's great to share this platform with you all. And watching that video, I was struck by the word fear. Um, because it's a word that I think is all too common to LGBTI people, regardless of age. And I see a, a great connection to young people's experiences, you know, and, uh, you know, t thinking about the role of philanthropy and what it's meant to belong to an LGBTI young people. I think that the progress we've seen over the last decade and a half 
simply wouldn't have happened at the pace it has happened uh, without philanthropy. And, you know, I was struck um, when Grania was speaking earlier on about Atlantic philanthropies and the role it's played in the community, but also to, to name check another, I suppose, major philanthropic organisation in the One Foundation and the role it played for LGBTI young people. Um, and really kind of the network of LGBT youth services that we see across the country with 52 and mounting um, is really down to, I suppose, maybe the, the, the courage that was shown by that philanthropic organisation um, in investing at a very early stage. And it's been supported by many others since, including the Community Foundation, um, as Denise mentioned, around uh, making the services accessible to people who don't have English as a first language, for instance. Um, and it's, I suppose, uh, there's so many uh, points to think of. And I think that notion of journey is very important. I think a, a journey for us as a movement towards uh, equality in the country um, but listening to my fellow panellists talk, uh, one thing that I'm struck by is that journeys aren't linear. Um, and it feels right now with the rise of the far right, um, with the emergence of turf ideology and debate in the Irish press and otherwise, that uh, we are in danger of things slipping slightly, particularly when our community is suffering and hurting so much from uh, the last year of the pandemic and all of the stress that that has brought to each and every one of us who are here today, but also to the most marginalised parts of our community, some of whom um, we've touched on already. Um, and back in lockdown number one, we moved quite quickly to undertake some research to really understand uh, kind of the uh, the scale of what was happening for LGBTI young people, because what we saw in the first two weeks was actually a complete drop off in the need for support. Um, and it's fascinating that when we look back at what happened for LGBTI young people in lockdown number one, it was the absence of going to school in those first two weeks was a relief. Um, the previous November, so November of 2019, we had published a piece of research that told us that 72% of LGBTI young people didn't feel safe in school um, and had a fear about going to school because of discrimination, persecution, being misgendered, misnamed, whatever it might have been, and to see that disappear. But very quickly, it gave way to very harrowing experiences with almost 40% of young people not feeling welcome in their own home when they're forced to be there and not to leave. And very sadly, 95% of LGBT young people are suffering with extreme stress, anxiety or depression at the moment. And that compares to about 53% of the general youth population. So you can get a sense of the scale of the impact. Um, and, I'm, I, and I know from having looked at the data and talked to our research team about what it looks like, those individuals who experience an intersection, whether it be racism or neurodiversity or a disability or being stuck in the direct provision system, those, uh, that compounds the issues for those individuals. So I think there's a, a real sense of, um, I suppose, crisis going on within our wider LGBT community, not only because of the impact of COVID, but also because of very vocal uh, and emerging threats on the horizon towards the type of equal Ireland that we would all like to see. And to give you kind of a, an illustration of it, um, the number of people we supported last year was up 88% on the previous year. And it wasn't just about the volume of people who needed support, it was about how much more support they needed. So each individual is taking about 250% more interventions. That's more counselling appointments, more one-to-ones, phone calls, emails, and otherwise, of what we would already be a very stretched team. So, and we consider ourselves lucky in that we felt uh, quite well, I suppose, resourced compared to other partners in our sector to be able to respond to this. And it has been a massive challenge for us. So I think the impact um, of philanthropy really flows to not just that journey and the progress, but it's down into the individual moment of that person's life when they lift that phone and find that piece of courage to reach out for help, that they're met with a smile and a warm face and someone to talk to, and that a new journey for that individual starts, you know, um, and uh, so for, right from the very big wins of marriage equality, down to the very small victories for people who are choosing to lift phones, to send emails, to send a text message and say, I'm struggling and I need help. Um, and being there in those moments are probably some of the moments that are most um, joyous uh, for us in our organization. You know, I, I feel in my role, I'm very privileged. I get to spend my time with people uh, such as our panelists here and uh, all of you who are with us 
uh, who want to see that change in the world and connecting it to our team of change makers who make those things happen. Um, you know, and some of the, the campaigns we've seen and the attitudinal change we're seeing in society is coming about from the anti-bullying campaigns and the awareness campaigns that we've been running for a decade. You know, uh, last November, we had two campaigns stand up and come in that reached over half a million people right across the country um, uh, and right down into our school system. In fact, the number of schools involved went up. Um, which completely shocked us when we expected it uh, to slide back down. And maybe in conclusion there to touch on something that Lisa said, which I think is so important, um, is the sustainability and predictability. It allows organisations like us and belong to, LGBT Ireland, uh, GCN and others, to be able to plan for the future, to make decisions about what we need this year and next year, like those 1500 people Paul has identified need training. So those sorts of multi-annual partnerships become uh, exceptionally important to the sustainability of organizations and our ability to be able to think quite strategically about what we need to do, how we need to do it, and how we should go about doing it. Um, thanks, Mila. I'll hand back to you now, Grania. That's great, Oshin. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, again, we're back to the, the, the recurring image of the journey and that danger of slippage. And I think that is something that philanthropy uh, will look at and needs to look at in terms of uh, continuing to meet the needs. And some of those statistics that you cite are, are really um, very, very uh, disturbing. So, yeah, sustainability and predictability to allow us to plan, decide and meet the needs, so important. Okay, I'm going to move on uh, to our last panelist of this afternoon, uh, Gavin Hennessy, you're very welcome. Apologies, um, the quote of 2020, I was on mute. <laughs> um, I suppose I'd love to start by telling you a little bit more about myself to set the scene a little bit. Um, I'm a proud member of the LGBTQI plus community um, and I'm also a proud member of the traveling community. And the reason I start off with that is I think one of the most important things in the corporate world and in community um, more generally is having, um, I suppose, proud uh, champions and proud role models for people to look up to um, and also for us to have a voice within spaces where we don't usually have a voice. Um, if I think about maybe from a corporate perspective, you know, what are the challenges that we might face and sometimes I think when we think about philanthropy and the corporate world, I find that sometimes there's a gap between our languages. Um, so if we look at, you know, the language that NGOs are speaking and what they're looking for, versus what corporates are trying to achieve and the impact they want to make. Sometimes we always don't align. Um, and I think um, what we've had an advantage of in Irish life is um, my background's actually from the nonprofit sector. So I'm able to speak, I suppose, bridge that gap and speak both languages. Um, and if I look back to my time in the NGO sector and what were the, those challenges face, facing us all the time, and just going back to Lisa's point around sustainability and that that is the key challenge for the NGO se sector. How do we get unrestricted funds? So we, we all know that corporates love the sexy programs to, to support and they're very specific in those support. But what about staffing? You know, who's going to run that program? What if that person's only there for 12 months? Um, you know, what are the, the kind of, I suppose, the key issues that organizations need funding for um, is a big question that we always ask for in Irish life. And I think that's a surprise now when our partners come to us is, you know, they ask for one thing, but we go back and say, well, we'd love to support that. But is there an area where we can make more impact? Is there an area where, you know, it can offer more support while we know that you're coming to us with this ask because, you know, we think we might fund it. Um, but what is the real thing that you need funding for? Um, and those are the kind of real beneficial conversations that we have um, with our partners. And I think if we look at the corporate side um, then and we look at the challenges um, internally and the questions we're asking ourselves, you know, we're looking at how do we bring authenticity to what we're doing? We don't want to just tick a box. We don't want to be seen as just supporting something because it's the, the nice thing to do or it's trendy right now. Um, so we always go back to impact again. 
Um, I think a great example of, of that recently is our sponsorship of the Dublin Devils, um, where we have a three year sponsorship. Um, we really worked um, collaboratively with them to really build out that partnership around not just you know offering to be sponsors, but looking at how can we increase diversity within the team itself? Um, how can we provide access to maybe um, supports that they haven't access to already? Um, and then how can we look at you know supporting them beyond just this sponsorship deal and integrating them in with our business? You know, how can we get them involved in activities that we do internally and externally? Um, if I look then to, you know, around other challenges in the corporate space, it's around not just CSR, but how do we bring all of our elements of culture together? So whether it's CSR, whether it's ESG, whether it's diversity, inclusion, well-being, there's so many different things that often work in silos. And I think a lot of people on this call will and, and panel will understand of the lack of clarity of who's the right person to contact. So we're working as an organization to make all of our culture elements a bit more streamlined um, and more connected um, and easier to communicate both internally and externally. Um, and that is, you know, um, in order to make us to be easier to do business with. And if I look back at some of the successes around philanthropy, you know, what's important to us? I think it's really important to point out that corporate sometimes can be very focused on one element of, of an issue. So we all know with the LGBTQI plus community, there's so many different layers. Um, and we really take a layered approach to our support of the community. So if I look at around sharing our stories, um, we're a very um, long partnership we belong to over the last number of years around sharing um, stories of, you know, the, the trans community or, or other elements of the community. Um, if we're looking at LGBT 101 sessions, so we as a big organization have a tendency to go to big consultancies often for these solutions, but a big area that we push in Irish life is how do we support local organizations, smaller niche um, NGOs, um, and see them as niche consultancies rather than always going to the big consultant. Um, I think another thing is how do we support the, the wider community? How do we support with information sharing and how do we make sure that, you know, um, things continue um, even in hard times? So um, I was really um, proud to support GCN um, during the pandemic. Um, it was something that um, just made sense to us and we, we continue to work with GCN in how to kind of develop that relationship. And I've spoken already about, you know, um, supporting the well-being of the LGBT plus community um, and the Dublin Devils um, sponsorship is a real kind of great example of how we're doing that. I think just to kind of finish up, you know, what's next for Irish life? What things are we thinking of? And a big thing for us in 2021, 2022 is um, how do we support and go further um, in our support. So how do we challenge taboos, you know, in a sense, whether it's around HIV, um, whether it's around, you know, looking at more trans supports in the workplace, if we're looking at inclusive well-being as a whole. So how do we look at our products and our services and ensure that we're meeting the needs of all of our customers, not just our traditional customers? So I think if I was just to give one takeaway for, for this panel discussion, I would say that Corporates are here, they're, they're really looking to, um, to support, but often they don't know how, and there's often a gap between what NGOs or the community sector are looking for and what the, the kind of corporate side um, know what they can achieve. So if I could give one kind of piece of advice, it's, it's trying to come with the most complete proposal you can, um, looking at things like what is the organization's strategy, you know, what, who is our customers, and things like that will make it easier and more successful in, in your pitches. So thanks very much for having me. Delighted to have an opportunity to speak to you. That's great, Gavin. Thank you so much for that. And I think that last point about, you know, the corporates need to know how to support, what is it that, that people look for? And I know that that's one of the, in terms of supporting donors and grantees that Community Foundation do, which is supporting uh, donors to be able to find a match. Janice, do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, looking to the future and, you know, how do you match the needs with the fund? Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose the first thing for us is to see what the needs are. So to try and have some evidence base about what the need is. And very often that's done in a combination of ways it can be done through our research tool, uh, vital, uh, vital Signs. It's done by consultation with 
the change makers that are here and beyond. Um, and often we survey as well, just to find out like what are the pressing issues um, that donors might invest in. It's often great for us to have kind of a, an approach of, of the different areas. So donors have different interests. Some are interested in research, some are interested in direct um, uh, impact and service provision. Some are interested in a longer, more strategic approach. Um, and I, I totally agree with Gavin. Some of our job is to try and package with partners and um, to, to meet, to match, you know, what's the demand that's out there and what's uh, the donor interested in and how might we, we, we uh, align them. Um, but I suppose for us in developing our commitment and uh, kind of reigniting that commitment to LGBTI plus um, it is really, I suppose, about thinking in the strategic long term, where can we help where others don't? Where can donors come in? Um, and sometimes it is that surf surfacing and making is vis uh, issues visible. Sometimes, like as Lisa said, revenue models have been wiped out. What does that mean for the sector? You know, can it support in that way? So really listening to what our strategic partners on the ground tell us is needed. And there's been fantastic, um, if not harrowing, examples given today. And then how do we bring that information to donors and say, you know, you have an interest in this area. Will you partner with us? This is what the groups on the ground have told us need us. So we're going to develop a criteria that will allow the money to be um, uh, strategic in a transparent way. And so it's it's a process for operation of listening um, and matching and, and really trying to there uh, where, where others can't be or to where others are to really add value. And I suppose as well, I'm just looking at some of the comments that I'd like to share with you. Laura O'Donovan just a few seconds ago said, I think it's great that Irish Life and other companies are supporting GCN. It's so important to keep the engagement and the visibility out there in society. And these partnerships go a long way to do that. So good support there coming in. Uh, Mathilda sent in a comment, Belong To does a fantastic job. We were honoured to partner with them in 2020 for a virtual uh, uh, event. And and Hayley says, you know, this is such important work. Thank you to all of you for what you are doing. Uh, and again, uh, somebody getting back to Denise's early comments, such exciting news from the Community Foundation. That's from Alicia from Sporting Pride. So a lot of positive uh, uh, comments coming in there. In the few moments that we have left, Paula, can I go back to you and ask you, you know, you gave us insight into a lot of the issues that you're seeing. If I could wave a magic wand and give you the money to do one thing over the next, say, two years, what would you plumb for if you had to? I know that's a hard question, but <laughs> what would you go for? That's like, is there a God question, Gronje? Um, yeah, well, I okay. can answer that one easy oh. enough. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong audience, yeah. I oh, know. I think off the top of my head, I would say, I would say training of mainstream services. I think that's how. Ultimately, I think until all LGBTI people can be visible and comfortable in accessing mainstream services, whether that be homeless services or healthcare or in their schools, then we're not going to make that dent in, in the stigma that's still there so that's what i would see like we we're, we're you know the sector is small and and we are it's great we're doing a lot of work but i think that how we're going to go on the next journey in ireland is to really change this the systems and make them really inclusive and and to understand the needs of our community how to talk to us how to to make us feel welcome and it's quite simple actually a lot of the steps are quite simple and Pete, there's a real good intention there. There's a lot of goodwill now since the referendum. So that's what I would see if they could wave a magic wand. That's what I would do. OK, thanks, Paul. I know that was a hard one. And um, Oshin, going back to you, I, I was really taken by your description of, you know, somebody gets the courage and they, they, they come to you and they get a smile and a warm face and they're on a new 
journey. I mean, that's a wonderfully empowering uh, image that you give. And these, some of these are small wins, but my goodness, for the individual, they are transformational. Um, I suppose I, I'd ask you, you know, in terms of the intersectional work that you were talking about, are there particular intersectionalities that you would prioritize without saying some are more important than others, but I'm thinking of your mentioning of, you know, uh, people in direct provision, for example, or trans or traveler. Are there particular intersectionalities that you are seeing in these COVID times maybe that are really, really under the thumb? Um, yeah, sadly, Grania, that uh, you know, we are, I think, members of our community uh, who are in, or, who are trapped inside the direct provision system, and let's call it what it is. It's a, it's a racist system uh, perpetrated by government. But uh, you know, like, really, are I, I suppose an afterthought in, in many ways within our community. Um, but I think each of the intersections is, is there are commonalities and differences, you know, and I think it's about grappling and understanding the complexities and how, as Paula puts it, those simple tweaks for even for us as LGBT organisations, because we have to change and evolve to meet the unique needs, you know, and I, even listening to Gavin introducing himself there, like one of the pieces that we're doing is implementing uh, the traveller inclusion toolkit within our own services so that we're sure that our services are a welcoming place for members of the Roma and travelling community who might come to us for support. So I think there's a, a need for reciprocity and for us to have diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think, you know, Lisa and GCN were a great example of how they pulled the community together in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter to support Black, African and minority ethnic members of our community here in Ireland. Um, and those pieces, I think, are really critical. And I think it's something we as a community should be quite proud of is that the antennae are up. And I think there's an openness and a willingness because we've seen what the other side of it is like. And we know what it's like to have the door closed in your face or to have the, the ra racist or misogynistic comment thrown, you know? Yeah, really good. And um, back to you, Lisa, Lisa, in terms of the work in GCN, you know, managing this publication, you've talked about, you know, mother, the live events are gone, you know, trying to keep that need such an important place for information, for visibility, again, looking at, you know, into your magic ball and me with my magic wand, what would be the big, if I could give you, you know, pot of money to make something happen over the next year or two for GCN, what would you go for? um wow yeah i i um i really i really liked what paula said about um systems and how systems actually need to do like there's a lot of systemic change that is needed and look i don't need to to, to mention the news cycle of the last few weeks even from a state level of what what you know the the country has been reckoning with around mother and baby homes so a lot of systemic work and i think our role uh, as lgbtq organizations is to keep that role of agitators and and really pushing and centering the voices that we know you know that were historically marginalized and in terms of gcn's work it is just for us to sustainably stick around so we can keep amplifying those voices because you know the mainstream media um is great but it's it does its thing and we there's a really important role for us to provide visibility and representation and so and also that advocacy work of you know having the petition because the GMHS is still closed as an example or you know standing in solidarity with um, folks who suffer from you know racism and the other isms and obviously the emerging threat around folks who are transphobic and how that's manifesting in Ireland so I think the the simple answer is just the you know keeping keeping it sustainable and keeping it in business so that it can keep amplifying uh, our community's voices. Great. Thanks, Lisa. And finally, just go back and give you, I know we're a couple of minutes over, but there's nobody coming after us, so we can steal a few moments. Um, I wanted to go back to, to yourself in terms of, you know, the corporates need to know how to support organisations. I think that's a really important point. Do you want to elaborate just a little bit on what you meant by that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, often when you're, um, 
I suppose when in the corporate sphere, it, it's easy to go to the easy thing, um, and it's easy to go to the thing that everyone everyone is supporting. We all know ourselves with with, with the pride parade as well that the level of corporate you know involvement since the marriage referendum has you know gone exponential. Um, but like, how many of those corporates are really supporting the community throughout the year? Um, and I think, you know, um, I suppose to flip it back on the corporate side, you know, we really need to challenge ourselves to see are we supporting the right things and are we actually making an impact? Um, and that's the question that we keep asking ourselves at Irish Life and Candle Life is um, not what is everyone else doing, is, but what is nobody doing and, and where can we make an impact? You know, um, I think um, Irish Life Health was the first um, medical insurer to actually provide uh, services for the tra for the transgender community um, to support transitioning um, and you know I think that's something I'm really proud of and something that the organization is really proud of and I think from our point of view you know we do things very quietly we're not really people who shout about it um, a lot so we tend to not just talk to talk but walk to walk um, and I just would encourage any other corporates on the on the call to kind of one, look at how we can support better and two, where, where the areas where the, the impact is needed um, most. Um, and I think if we're looking at, you know, sometimes organizations can be fearful of reaching out and saying the wrong thing. Um, and often I think the best thing to do is reach out, say the wrong thing. And that's a great start to a better relationship moving on from there. Absolutely. Super. OK, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, really fascinating mm -hmm. panel. I want to thank each of you. Um, you know, Denise started off laying out the offer. Community Foundation are looking to continue this work. And this is part of the consultation process. And goodness knows, Denise, I think you got a long list from the panelists today uh, to, 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 to start you off. We heard the outstanding agenda, both nationally mm -hmm. and globally. And I think that point about you know, not losing sense. Uh, we have come a long way in Ireland, but there are still many people who are deeply isolated, unhappy and in a bad situation here. And of course, solidarity with our, our, our global family. Um, so I want to thank each of you uh, for uh, this afternoon, for your time, for your obvious preparation. I want to thank those who logged in and joined the conversation. And um, yeah, happy Winter Pride, everyone. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Grania, and thank you to the whole panel. Um, we're looking forward to this June when Dublin Pride will be able to work closely with the Community Foundation to find ways to support our community. Uh, tomorrow, our focus is going to shift. Uh, we're going to focus in on how we can support those who've lost jobs due to the COVID crisis and those who are entering the workforce for the first time. This whole conference, as its principal funder, has the LGBT Community Services Fund from the Department of Children, Equality, Integration, Disability and Youth. And we are delighted that tomorrow we will have the Minister, Roderick O'Gorman, uh, to open up the day's session with a welcome address. Uh, over the rest of the, of the evening, the virtual community centre is going to stay open, the networking functions stay open, so feel free to hang out over the next hour, five hours, however long you want, and, and use the facilities. Before I go, there is just one thing I want everyone to think about today. Uh, today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. If you look up Holocaust, you generally see a list of 10, 10 groups of people. There were 10 main groups of people uh, who were the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, I was born into one of them, and then I grew into another one. Those 10 groups are still some of the most discriminated against people in society today. Anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, ableism, homophobia, transphobia are still real and present threats to our society. Today, it's good that we remember, but it's important that every other day of the year we do something to challenge that discrimination. It's not enough that we don't discriminate. We need to actively do something to stop discrimination. Until tomorrow, have a very good evening. Thank you very much. Brod Hanna. <laughs>